Is it possible to know personally the king of the universe? That's the question we're looking at today. Can I know God personally? On, on the one hand, it doesn't really seem possible, does it? I mean, how can, how can we know the God of 100 billion galaxies? How, how can we know the God of the Milky Way where just to cross our galaxy would take 100,000 years at the speed of light? Actually knowing God, actually having a personal relationship with God, what an, what an amazing possibility. Way back there, I remember in the movie E.T., remember how E.T., uh, his little finger lit up and he told Elliot, I'll be right here, you know, and poked poked him on the forehead with the idea in mind that even though they were on different galaxies, that they would still remain connected. They would still uh, talk to each other, even though they were far, far away. I mean, everybody thought that was pretty cool, you know, to have your own alien friend on another galaxy that you could actually have mental telepathy with. But God promises that to us as not just another alien being, but the God who created the entire universe. So if this is possible, if it is possible that we could personally know God, it's the most amazing connection that anybody could ever think of. Now, not surprisingly, people have been chasing this connection throughout history. And and that's what religion is all about. There are over 4,000 recognized religions in our world today. And in all of these religions, people are seeking to have a connection with God. They're trying to find God somehow. And this is where Jesus comes in. Now, Jesus actually came, let me say it this way, Jesus came to bring the end of religion or, or to, 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 to show that there is not, no need for religion anymore. He, he looked down from heaven and he saw that religion, frankly, just wasn't working. The concept of religion was to get to know God personally. Well, not working, okay? So Jesus was willing to come, God himself, to come to earth And to sacrifice his own life, not to start a new religion, but to mark the end of the need for religion. If all religious practices are are to get to know God personally, then Jesus brought a brand new plan. Instead of doing religious exercises to get to know him, Jesus came to say, here's what I've got. I will help you to know God personally. Now, this is what we're going to look at today. So let's, let's look at our outline and uh, open up our bear notes, and we're going to start with this statement. The way to God is a person, not a religion. The way to God is a person, not a religion. Nearly everybody assumes that the pathway to God is through uh, morality or religious rituals or or rule keeping or something like that, but actually that's the bad news. It's the bad news because we can't do that. We can never keep all the rituals perfectly. We can never keep all the rules perfectly. We can never be perfectly moral. So if that were the plan to to know God, we're all never going to make it. We're all failures. But what Jesus came to say is that the way to God is a person, not a religion. A person. That's the good news. The word good news, in, in, uh, it's the word gospel. And uh, the gospel is, a, is, the English, is another word for good news. In the Greek, it's called euangelion. So the first part means good, and the second part means angel, angelion. It's like a, a messenger. So it's a good message, L- like a message from the angels. The good news, it's like a message from the angels to us that we can know God personally. In John 17, 3, Jesus said, this was on the night that he was arrested, the day before he, he uh, was crucified, this is the way to have eternal life, by knowing you. He's, it's a prayer to God. This is the way to have eternal life, by knowing you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one that you have sent. We can know him. Knowing God, that's what eternal life is. We ask the question, can I know God personally? But here's the amazing thing. Okay, here's the amazing thing. God wants to know you personally. That, that kind of, that's kind of a whole different look on it, isn't it? God's plan is that he could have a personal relationship with you. 
Long before the earth was created, God set his heart on you. And God went to great lengths to connect with you. And he sent his son to come into the world to show you how you can personally know him. And if any other way would have worked, he wouldn't have had to do this. He wouldn't have had to die on the cross. But he did because he wants to know you personally. Now, Barna did a survey of American society asking the question, what one thing do you wish for the rest of your life? And actually, there were multiple choice of things that they could actually answer, more than one. But 75% of the people check the box that says to have a better relationship with God. The one thing people want in our world for the rest of their lives is to have a better relationship with God. It seems to be a pretty universal desire. But, but then we find out that the one thing that God wants the most is to have a relationship with you. It's one of the most startling claims in the world. So if the pathway to God is not through religious rituals or rules, then what is it? Well, let's look at the next point on our outline or the, our verse, and that is Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, so moral rule keeping is not going to make it, but the free gift of God. So it is a free gift that you can only receive. You can't earn it or deserve it. You can only receive it. Jesus took your place on the cross so that you could be in a personal relationship with him forever. It is a gift that he offers to you. Um, I remember as a teenager, I heard a pastor say this, and this, this proves that as a teenager, at least one Sunday, I listened to what it was being said. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> this pastor was asked, what is your favorite verse in the whole Bible? And he said, well, I'm gonna have to think about that for a little bit. But he came back and he said, this verse was the one that he felt like communicated the good news clearer than any other, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus came to earth, God himself came to earth, and he became sin for us. He took our sin on the cross so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He paid the price for our sins, past, present, and future, and then he imputed to us his righteousness. So when God the Father looks at us, he only sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ as our righteousness. An illustration that I've used a million times is like if there were a book, now this is actually a C.S. Lewis book, but anyway, if there were a book that had listed all of your sins, like everything that you've ever done wrong, every um, sin you've committed, everything you should have done that you didn't do, every bad attitude that you had, okay, all listed here for your entire lifetime. And so uh, here's you and here's all your stuff, right? And here's Jesus. And the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Jesus took our sin upon himself and he left us free. And now we stand in the very righteousness of God as a gift that was imputed to us. So in Galatians uh, 2.16, it says this, but we know that God accepts only those who have faith in Jesus Christ. We know that God accepts only those who what? Do rule keeping? Keep religious rituals? No. Only those who have faith in Jesus Christ because no one can please God by simply obeying the law. Morality just won't cut it. Rule keeping, rituals just won't cut it. It's not about being good. It's about coming back from the dead. It's about being born again. Um, A pastor in Austin um, adopted these two little uh, kiddos from Ethiopia. And he, he said that these children, um, they, they were older kids when, when he adopted them, and they were always worried that the adopted parents were going to abandon them. They were always afraid that the, the, adopted, ki- the adopted, adopted parents weren't going to like them at some point, and, uh, you know, we're going to kick them out or something like that. They were always worried about this. They didn't have the security. And, and so the, the guy said this, the dad said this. He said, their fear is ir- irrational. Because they did nothing to earn my love in the first place. 
and they can do nothing to cancel my love forever. And that's the way it is with God. Therefore, let's flip over the page. Therefore, relate to him as a friend. Therefore, relate to him as a friend. This was, has been Jesus' goal for us all, to enter into a deep personal relationship with him that can only be described by the word friend. It's actually the word that Jesus used on the night uh, uh, of his arrest, the day before his, his death, when he said to his disciples, I'm not going to call you disciples anymore. I'm not going to call you my students anymore. From now on, I'm going to call you my friends. We have built a relationship, and this is what I've always wanted to have, is a friendship with all of you. Now, um, why Jesus? Why Jesus? You might be asking the question, like, of all the religious leaders that have ever been, why is it that Jesus is the one? And uh, that's true. There are lots of religious leaders that have come throughout history. And all of them, you could say, were good teachers, maybe great teachers. The only thing is, you can't really say that about Jesus. You, you can't say that he was just a great teacher. Because there was something so unique about Jesus that you have to either reject him wholly or accept him as the Lord and the boss of your life. Now, let me tell you what I mean. Jesus said, for example, Jesus said to the people that were hearing, he said, I can forgive your sins to God. Now, who would say such a thing? I mean, nobody can do this, right? Nobody can forgive somebody else's sins to God. Like if you do something against me, I can forgive you for the, something you did against me, but I can't forgive you for something you did to someone else. But, but that's what Jesus said. He said, I can forgive your sins before God the Father. Now, what kind of cra- if that's not true, then that's crazy. I mean, if he can't actually pull that off, then, then that, no one would say that who is a good teacher. Only a crazy person would say that, unless it's true. Jesus said, I'm the creator of the universe. I was the one in the bush talking to Moses when I commanded him to set my people free. Now, who would say that? We all know the story about Moses and the burning bush, and uh, then how Moses finally decided to go back to Pharaoh and command, let my people go. You know, the, whole, the, the focus of that whole story is the burning bush. And Jesus said, that was me in that bush talking to Moses. Now, who would say such a thing? I mean, you'd have to say only a, cra- you know, only a crazed person would ever say that, unless it's true. And if it's true, you can't say he's just a good teacher. He's either a crazy person or he's the king of the world. Jesus said, before Abraham, I, before Abraham was, I am, and I always have been, and I always will be. So there's no option available just to say that Jesus was just another in a long line of good teachers from whom we can learn some good things from each. He proclaimed himself to be the Lord of the universe and the Lord of your life. And if you want to have a relationship with him, then you have to take him as he is, that he will be the boss of your life for the rest of your days if you are going to believe in him. You will have to live for him, and all of your life will have to be centered around him, or you have to go without him. Those are the choices. That's the deal. And you get to decide. Now, Jesus came to a certain point with his disciples that brought them to decision time. I mean, they loved the miracles. You know, all, uh, uh, thousands of people were following him. They loved the miracles. They loved Jesus bringing healing. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? They loved following along with all the crowd. But then Jesus stopped one day. He stopped and he turned around and he explained to them what it meant to repent and have faith and believe in the good news. Now, this is found in Luke chapter 14. And that's where we're going to look at right now. Luke 14, there's three things that he said that he was explaining what repentance and faith really means. And here we go. You ready? The first one is, don't let relationships come between you and God. That's the first thing he talked about. Don't let relationships come between you and God. So this is where he begins. This is Luke 14, verses 25 and 26. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, I'm sure that all these people who are following him and love see the miracles and love seeing all the healing, I'm sure all of them are like, what? What, what is he talking about here? He turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And so Jesus is bringing them to decision time. He's saying, here's how, here's how it works. If you haven't figured it out yet, let me explain it to you very clearly. You can't put relationships before your relationship with God. Now, he says the word hate here. Maybe that's too strong a word, but I assume it's some kind of colloquialism. You know, it's hard enough to translate Greek words from 2,000 years ago into English and make them make sense. It's really hard to translate colloquialisms from thousands of years ago into the modern day and and have it all uh, communicate well. I imagine a thousand years from now, if if the world is still still here, um, I imagine people look at some of the things that we've written down or some of the TikTok videos or whatever and wonder, you know, what in the world does that mean exactly? Uh, Because um, words can have so much nuance. But he, he used the word hate, and I think what he was trying to say is he's talking about a comparison. He said, the comparison between your love for God and your love for people have to be so different that it's almost like the difference between love and hate. We know that Jesus didn't want you to hate anybody because he already said you're supposed to love everybody. So, um, so it's a comparison. And isn't it true that some people put friends in front of God? Isn't it true that some people put family members in front of God? Isn't it true that sometimes a wrong friend might try to turn you away from your relationship with God. And sometimes uh, in, in a family, one spouse is for God, one spouse against God. That makes it tough. I remember Lee Strobel talking about that. Lee Strobel was an atheist. He and his wife were both kind of atheists. And that just worked out fine in their marriage, although their marriage was falling apart. But uh, it was fine. They, they at least agreed on that one thing. And then she became a Christian. And so uh, that created tension in their relationship. And so for two years, they were in this tense relationship. And Lee Strobel said he hated it. He hated what was happening to her. She was so friendly and nice and everything. He just hated that whole thing happening. And so, um, but she just had to say, you know, this is me. This is what I have to do. And if you're in that situation, that's what I recommend. You just got to say, you know, I'm not going to put pressure on you, but I have to do what's right for me. And... um, so she just followed the Lord quietly um, during those two, that two-year period. And then finally, uh, Lee saw the light, and he became a believer too. And then they were united together in their faith. But um, some people let friends, spouses, relationships, family turn them away from God. What Jesus said here is, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, it might mean they, they're not allowed to. That could be it. But I, I think what he's saying is that it just won't work. You just can't make it happen. You can't have a person as your God and then also try to have Jesus as your God. It just doesn't work. You cannot be my disciple. It just won't work. Well, that brings us to the second one. Don't let personal ambitions come between you and God. Don't let personal ambitions come between you and God. And that's an interesting one because we live in a in a culture of personal ambition, right? I mean, wouldn't you say that personal ambition is about the the key uh, concept, you know, in the whole American culture? Is everybody go for it, you know? But Jesus said, don't let personal ambitions come between you and God. In Luke 14, 27, it says, this is the next verse, and whoever does not carry their own cross. And follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, sometimes we talk about carrying a cross as being like an illness or something like that. And, and that's okay if you want to use that, uh, that concept. But that's not what Jesus was talking about here. What he's talking about, everybody knew what he was talking about here. When you carry a cross, just like Jesus did uh, down the Via Della Rosa, uh, he put his cross on his shoulder. He carried it up to the hill of Mount Calvary, and he, would, he died there. So when you carry a cross, it's saying you carry it to the place of death. 
You die to self-gratifying ambition. You die to the world around you as being your God. You die to anything that takes place in your life. And whoever does not carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. My disciple. It says cannot. It, says, it just doesn't work. You can't do it. You can't say that Jesus is your king, but he's in third place behind job and family or whatever it might happen to be. It just can't work. Whoever does not carry their own cross cannot be my disciple. Now, this verse helped me understand this a lot. In, this is Galatians 6.14. This is Paul talking about kind of how he, how he understands that concept. And Paul said, as for me, God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in all the attractive things of the world was killed long ago. And the world's interest in me is also long dead. He said, to me, carrying the cross means the world died to me. You know, he's like, hey, you're dead to me. <laughs> the world died to me. It's just, it's just not that important anymore. Because my relationship with God is so important that, my, that the world then just takes a huge second place. It died to me. It no longer holds that personal ambition, attraction to me anymore. Jesus knows that if you focus your chief loyalty on anything other than God, you risk huge disappointments in life. You know, career is great, but if your career becomes everything, you're probably going to ruin your family in the process and your relationship with God and your health and everything else, right? Money is great, but it, it can't truly satisfy your soul. And by the way, when you die, you're not going to have it anymore. The pleasure is fine for a while, but it still doesn't satisfy you ultimately. Friends can fail you, but Jesus never will. And he is the only one who can truly satisfy your soul. Well, there's one more thing Jesus said that day. As he turned and confronted all those followers, thousands of people, and said, let me just explain to you what I'm talking about here, about what it means to be a disciple. He had one more thing. Number three, don't let things come between you and God. Don't let things come between you and God, your possessions. Jesus knew that possessions and things promise security, but they don't really pay off. Only true security can come from God your Father. So continue on. The next verse says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? That makes perfect sense. Then down in verse 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. He's saying everybody needs to figure out the cost. You need a cost estimate here of your project. What is your project? If your project is to be a disciple of Jesus, then in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Give up your possessions and your money as the source of your hope and security. You can't put your hope both in money and in God. So every time I write a check, to God, you know, my tithe check, at least 10% of my income, every time I write a check, I'm saying to myself, my money does not hold a grip on me. All of my money belongs to God, and I'm giving a portion of it back to him, but my security is not found in my money. My security is only found in God. Jesus knew this secret about material possessions. The secret is if you hold on to them, they can ruin you. But they can be used for the advancement of good and love in the world if you will hold them as a manager, hold them lightly as a manager, that God owns them and you're just managing them, and then use them to make a difference in the world. In, in, in Luke 14, uh, at the end of, this is at the end of this passage, because this is kind of like the last thing he said, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Okay, he's saying, listen carefully. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. He's saying, what I'm saying here is really important. If you get it, it'll change your life. That's what he's saying. It's not that possessions are evil. Rather, if devoted to God, they can be a part of the salt and the light that transforms the world, that brings hope, that brings love to the world. Now, I know that everybody here struggles with money in one way or another. Um, but we also have to remember that we are the 1% in the world, right? I mean, 99% of the world lives in a lower standard of living than we do. So if we're the top 1%, we got to figure out a way to work, make this money thing work and not just live under its pressure all the time. I remember when we were in India, we, we visited this uh, blind pastor, and he lived in this little makeshift stick house. They'd actually like gone out, he and his wife, he's blind, but anyway, he and his wife went out and they, you know, use a hatchet and they chop down little pieces of like mesquite trees and um, dig a, a little trench and stick the poles in them and try to pack them down and then loop them together with, uh, with barbed wire, that kind of thing. And he made this little hut and a, and a roof over it. And uh, right before we got there, uh, there was a big uh, windstorm, rainstorm, and it blew his hut over w- with him and, his, and their baby inside. Fortunately, they were not injured. But anyway, they had put it, by the time we got there, they had put it back up. And when we got back, I remember uh, Frank Ritz specifically said, you know, we got we to gotta build that poor guy a house. So we sent $1,000 over there, and they built a, um, a home out of cinder blocks. So it was nice and strong. It had two windows in it and a door, and it was eight feet tall with a tin roof, but the walls only went up seven feet. So there was one foot of uh, circulation, you know, that could go through all the way around the top. But that pastor and his wife, they were just thrilled to death about that. It's just a one-room house. It did did have electricity where he could plug in a refrigerator and a little like a heating stove kind of thing. No bathroom, but they were just thrilled to have a house like that. And I was thinking, none of us would ever want to live in a place like that. But, but that's how much of the world lives. So we, the 1%, we got to figure out a way to deal with money. That's what Jesus is trying to help us with. He's trying to say, if possessions become your God, if money is your God, then it's going to be greatly disappointing to you in this life. You're going to live under the pressure of that your entire life. In Philippians 3, Paul said this, Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The story of history is not that humanity is searching for God. The story of God's history is that God is searching for you and for me. And he wants to have a personal relationship with us. But if he's going to have a personal relationship with us, it has to be on his terms. It has to be what following a disciple is all about. He's searching for us. He left heaven and Jesus came to earth just so he could show us how we can have a friendship with God. And now each day, Like Paul, we can press on. We can press on for the goal of what God has given to us. Now, um, some time ago when when Peggy was at uh, Cook Children's Hospital, a lady there shared with her a story uh, that she had just gotten off the phone with a a missionary who was in the Congo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, of, of the Congo. I almost said Congo there. Okay, Congo. All right. So, but anyway, I wrote down that story because it was so powerful, and I wanted to always remember this. Well, anyway, here's the story. You ready? This is so neat. So the, this missionary was there, and they, he had a team of several people who came in with uh, well drilling equipment, and they were going to have it there for a week. And so... Um, each day then, they were going to go to a different village and drill a well for that village. And they could do it all in one day, pretty much. So they said they started at daybreak at 6.30 in the morning, and then they drilled until, uh, until whenever they got things, uh, you know, squared away. And usually they finished up by about 3 in the afternoon, something like that. And if they didn't finish, they would come back the next day and do that one again. But uh, a lot of time, they could do it all in one day. And so they were going to try to hit like seven villages over that, that week period that they were there. And then in the evening, they wanted to share with the villagers, you know, about Jesus Christ. And so that's what they were doing. So 
the first day, they dr- drilled a well in this particular village. Um, and then um, that night, they held a gathering there. And then the next night, they, the next day, they did a village like three miles away. And they, um, that night then, they had a, a gathering, and they shared the gospel, they shared the good news about Jesus with all the people there. And they noticed something. There was a little girl, like a 12-year-old girl, that was on the front row in both places. And so they, they were asking her, well, we saw you last night, so you're over here, you know, and there's this other village. And this little girl said, yeah, you know, she said, what happened to me last night is that uh, the message that you shared about Jesus transformed my life. And I wanted my family members to hear it. She said, I've got family members. She said, I've got family members in every one of these villages around here. And so I just came over here tonight and I got all them and they were all sitting like on the front row on the floor, you know, right there. And uh, so they said, well, well, here's what, here's what we're going to be tomorrow. We're going to be here to the next day and here the next day. And so they were, you know, traveling in their land, in their Range Rover. You know, sometimes you have to go like actually through a river, you know, to get to some of these villages. But anyway, they were, they were going to go like five miles over this way the next day and then two miles this way to the next village and then six miles this way to the next village. So they were just making all the villages around there. And she said, well, I'm going to be at every one. So <clears throat> on the last night, um, they, you know, it was after everything was over, so it's late and they're getting ready to head back to their hotel or wherever they were staying. And they got in the Range Rover and they pulled forward like two feet and bump, they hit something. And they got, oh no, did we hit somebody? And they jumped out and ran around. It was that little girl. And they said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, I'm okay. Just, just a little bump, you know, <laughs> I'm okay. And they're like, well, what are you doing down there on the ground? Were you like hiding in front of our Range Rover? And she said, she said, no, I had polio as a child and I can't walk. So I've been crawling for, um, from one village to the other because I wanted my relatives so much to hear um, the good news of Jesus Christ. And they were just taken back. And this little girl, she crawled like 100 miles that week from one village to another so that her relatives hear the good news about Jesus Christ. It's this treasure that we have and we get a chance to share it with the world. It's the salt and light of the world and it's our chance to tell everybody. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that we thought we were searching for you and we didn't know that you were searching for us. So thank you. You've offered us this great opportunity, the chance to know you personally, the king of the universe. I pray, Lord, that everyone who can hear my voice would say to you right now, yes, I receive you into my life. And let us take that message, the good news, and tell everybody. In his name we pray, amen.